Hi, I'm Troy Lacey with Answers in Genesis, and I'm here with Dr. Danny Faulkner. Dr. Faulkner holds an MS in Physics from Clemson University, and an MA and PhD in Astronomy from Indiana University, and taught at the University of South Carolina for over 26 years. He now works as a researcher, author, and speaker for Answers in Genesis, and he runs several astronomy programs and events here at the Creation Museum, like the Stargazers and Sunspot Workshops. Danny has also written several programs for our planetarium here at the Creation Museum. We're here with Danny today to discuss his newest book, The Expanse of Heaven, Where Creation and Astronomy Intersect. The book is a follow-up to his create, Created Cosmos book released last year. Danny, thank you for taking time to speak with us today. Oh, thank you for having me, Troy. All right. Um, tell us a little bit about the book, The Expanse of Heaven. What made it... What motivated you to do a sequel to The Creative Cosmos? Okay, The Creative Cosmos was a book about uh, biblical astronomy. There hadn't been a book written on this in more than 100 years. And in the book, I basically go through all the references to astronomical bodies in the Bible, which a huge number of them, actually, and um, just discuss those and describe those for people and kind of brought it all up to date from the last attempt over a century ago. When I got done, I realized uh, there are a couple of shortcomings a lot of people reading this book might have. Number one, I didn't talk about the age issue much at all in that book, which is kind of big to us since we believe in six-day recent creation. And the other thing, I didn't talk about the uh, science, as it were, for, um, for creation. We, have, you know, we, we pursue what's called creation science, interpreting the world in terms of the creation model. And uh, I didn't do much of any of that in this book. So that wasn't the purpose of this book. So when I got done with this, I thought, we really need to do a instead of a sequel, call it a companion book to it. We wanted the same size, same format for the thing. And this one's more about the science of it all. Uh, I've already really the foundation refer back to this book, but then I do, of course, refer to scripture from time to time in it. But I want to talk about uh, the survey of everything in the universe <clears throat> in terms of how we as creationists would interpret that. Okay. And do you have a targeted audience for this book? Yeah, I think informed lay people. Uh, consider high school, even junior high perhaps, but high school and above, adults. Uh, it's not a real technical book. When I do bring in technical terms, I, I try to define those as well. It's occurred to me the two books together could be used as a textbook uh, in, a, in a, say, a college astronomy class in a, in a creation university somewhere. Even high school could be adapted for that. It's not written as a textbook, but the organization of this book particularly follows that typically of a, of a of an astronomy textbook used at the college level. So a wide range of people, people just interested in astronomy, interested in creation, interested in creation and astronomy, and also for textbook. And uh, I can testify that uh, as you're going through the books, the spots where Danny starts getting into the math, he explains it well so that you can follow along with it. And, uh, and I avoid equations, too. He avoids <laughs> equations as much as possible. Uh, one of the many things which stood out for me in the book and which I found fascinating was the discussion which, uh, of what causes the seasons on the earth. And I think this is often uh, oversimplified or misconstrued in textbooks or in nature documentaries or science documentaries. And uh, I thought you did an excellent job on explaining that. Could you uh, maybe go in a little depth on that for us here? Okay, about the seasons themselves? Yes. Uh, I've discovered all my years of teaching and speaking as well. Um, there are many misconceptions, and the cause of the seasons is one of them. Most people get this idea, you know, we're tilted. Here's the sun, here's the earth, we're tilted. North axis, uh, the hemis northern hemisphere is tilted towards the sun in the, in the summer, and we're tilted away from the sun in the winter, and they understand, well, that tilt, but then they think it's the distance. You know, you tilt toward, you're closer. Over here, you're farther away, so it must be the distance. The problem is the Earth's diameter is only 8,000 miles, and the distance to the sun is 93 million miles. So if you went completely uh, the diameter of the Earth, that would be less than one, -tenth, uh, one hundredth of one percent of the distance change. Obviously can't be that. Plus, we're actually uh, closer to the sun in uh, January than we are in July because we follow an elliptical orbit around the sun, so we're about three percent closer in January. So we would all have summer in January if that were the case. And I uh, always kind of, kind of put this in terms of what I call the uh, area effect and time effect. If you imagine you took a flashlight and shined a beam of light down, almost straight down onto this table, you would illuminate an area about this big. But uh, that would be like during noon in uh, early summer for us in June. But in December, the light rays are coming in at a much grazing angle like this. They hit, and it's spread out over a much larger area. So you're, you're taking the same amount of sunshine, but you're 
irradiating in a much larger area, and so it's not as efficient. Things are cooler in the winter. Uh, plus, the sun is up for a longer period of time in the summer it, uh, because of the, the way the, the sky is arranged. That comes up in the next chapter in the book. And uh, this talks about the fact that the, uh, the uh, being up for, say, 15, 16 hours in the summer as opposed to 8, 9 hours in the winter, you've got a lot more time for the sun's rays to interact with the earth and heat it up. So time effect, area effect, all caused by that tilt and our revolution around the sun. And I found that in my uh, university teaching days, I'd get a class of 20 or 30 students. It was not unusual to not find one student in my class who could really explain the cause of the seasons. So that was a big thing to me. I wanted people to come out of my classroom knowing a few things. That was one of them, the true cause of the seasons. Right. Yeah, that really struck me as, as an interesting segment of the book. Uh, another one that captured my attention was your coverage of the planets and their satellites um, in Chapter 5. I learned quite a bit as I was reading it. Could you give uh, our audience uh, an overview of that topic? Okay, I, I particularly described them divided. We have two types of planets, Jovian and terrestrial. The Jovian are the Jupiter-like, the terrestrials are the Earth-like, the first four and the second four. Um, but then I went into more detail discussing them. Uh, one thing I've really thought about a lot over the years is the Venus and Mars are the closest planets to us, one a little closer, one a little farther from the sun, and they both um, have some interesting stories to tell. Um, Mars has uh, got a thin atmosphere, a little smaller than the Earth. It does have a tilt like we do. It does have seasons like we do. Uh, the, the similarity is kind of in there. Uh, there's not a lot of water on Mars. We've detected a little bit of it. There's a little bit of vapor in the atmosphere and some ice. How much ice is in the soil, we don't know. But it's a very dry planet. You know, if you, Troy, if you took a container of water on the surface of Mars and poured it out, a portion of it would almost immediately boil away, and a portion would almost, the red remainder would almost immediately freeze because liquid water can't exist at the temperature and pressure on, on Mars. Um, yet, there's abundant evidence that there was once a tremendous amount of water on the surface of Mars. Flowing across the surface, we see a lot of stream beds, we see shorelines high up on hillsides. And it's led uh, some scientists, these are secular scientists, to conclude that there was once a global or near global flood on Mars, a planet that has no liquid water. Yet the same scientists would deny such a possibility could have existed on the Earth, and a planet that's abundant in liquid water. Uh, also, Venus uh, shows evidence of a very catastrophic and rapid uh, motion of plate motion, overturning the geology of the planet in a relatively short time scale. We propose, in most of our flood models, that that sort of thing happened on the Earth during the time of the flood. Again, secular scientists uh, say that couldn't have happened on Earth, but they readily adopt or accept the fact that it happened on Venus. It's almost as if the Lord said, okay, if you don't believe there was a flood, I'll show you the two separate processes that were involved on these two different planets. And here in the 21st century, you can appreciate that fact. I also talk about uh, evidences of a recent origin and design in many of the uh, other planets and their satellites. Uh, for instance, uh, the three of the four Jovian planets, the gas giants, give off about twice as much heat from the, that they get from the sun. What's the source of that energy? Nobody knows. The most obvious answer would be primordial heat from the uh, beginning of the solar system. Uh, the problem is, if it's billions of years old, they would have radiated away that heat already, and yet they're still quite warm. Why? Uh, we see the ring systems are uh, very short-lived. Uh, time to time you hear news stories, a new calculation, a new observation showing that ring systems fall apart very rapidly. And we're talking like a million years or less. And yet we have ring systems on four of the, all four of the Jovian planets. And we also see heat in some of the in, interesting geology inside of the, uh, of the uh, uh, some of the satellites of the outer planets. Finally, Pluto. Uh, Pluto was a big surprise a couple of summers ago. We had the first mission uh, to, to, to Pluto and the New Horizons mission, and it sent back these stunning photographs, and they were expecting to be heavily cratered. It wasn't. It uh, has some craters, but some regions are crater-free, indicating a lot of recent geological activity. But you need heat to do that, and Pluto doesn't have any source of heat. Big mystery yet today. And these all kind of suggest to me and to many others of us who are creationists that this is evidence for recent, recent origin. Right. They're not billions of years old. No. Uh, at the end of Chapter 10, you mentioned that the cosmic microwave background, CMB, can also be viewed as part of a biblical-based cosmology. That's kind of, kind of revolutionary as far as hearing that. Uh, so could you expound on that a little bit? Yeah, my, uh, I've published this up on our uh, Answers Research Journal here at the website at answersingenesis.org. And I've kind of uh, 
kind of rewrote it and popularized a little better for the um, lay audience in this book. But um, my ideas about cosmology have changed dramatically in the last couple of years. I've come to believe that this the thing called the rachia, that's uh, translated firmament in King James, expanse or sky, and a lot of other more modern translations of the Bible. I think that was the uh, probably talking primarily about what we call today outer space, where the astronomical bodies are. And this came about in day two. And uh, what God did is said, let there be this expanse of this rachia, uh, dividing waters below from waters above. We think we know what the waters below are. Those are the waters on the surface of the earth today. This would then suggest that um, if this is space, and I think it is, there's a strong biblical case for this, then um, several, three startling things. First of all, there's a, there's a center to the universe. Um, that's anathema in modern cosmology. There's supposed to be no center. And number two, if there is a center, uh, what's the probability in modern cosmology we're anywhere near the center? And this would suggest uh, from, the, from the day two account, we probably are close to the center, maybe not exactly at the center, but close to the center of the universe. It's a, not a geocentric in the sense we're motionless. We are moving, I do believe, but we are somewhere near the center, I think, from the scripture, the implication I get at least. Uh, another point is that there's an edge to the universe then. And that's startling because modern cosmology doesn't allow for an edge, and I'm not quite sure what that means physically. Uh, but then the, uh, perhaps the most remarkable thing is that just at this edge or beyond this edge, there's water, liquid water, I think, from the word mayim, which is liquid water in the Bible. Um, if that's the case, then I can now apply my physics. My model is the Earth is somewhere in here. The universe is really big with this edge to it. And then there's a layer of water all around this. And from physics, I know objects that have temperature, and I think, all objects must have a temperature. They must radiate. And if they radiate, they'll do it in a characteristic way. Uh, for objects we're familiar with, infrared is where we would measure those. As you get to cooler objects, it's over in a shorter wave, a longer wavelengths, uh, cooler parts of the spectrum. And I think uh, I've thrown this out as suggestion that this layer of water is radiating, and after it's been redshifted by the universe and all this sort of stuff, and the temperature it started with, this could be an explanation for that CMB, the cosmic microwave background. Um, ultimately, the evolutionists say it's coming from an early time period in the Big Bang model. I don't believe the Big Bang. I don't think it's physically uh, good, and I also certainly believe that that doesn't fit with Scripture. So uh, we creationists need uh, an explanation of what the CMB is, and my idea is, is providing at least a possible explanation. I think we can flesh it in later and do more tests on it, and uh, scientifically see if we can, we can make some predictions. Not there yet, but at least that's my initial idea on this. Yeah. Yeah, I found that part fascinating. Um, in, uh, shortly afterwards, there's a very clear gospel presentation in the conclusion of the book. And the theme of God's grand door is woven throughout the book, even though it's more so in the created cosmos. It's still very evident in the expanse of heaven. And um, it seems to just flow and blend in seamlessly then with God's care for humanity, his care his care and attention to detail in creation, his attention and care for humanity, um, as shown by Christ's death on the cross. And would you care to comment a little bit on this section of the book, which is obviously going to be surprising in an astronomy book, but not from a creation <laughs> viewpoint? Uh, you know, the whole point of creation is man. And if, you, if a person agrees with me about creation and agrees with biblical creation, that's fine. But that kind of misses the point. <laughs> Uh, the, the point of creation is man is the crown of creation. We are the only thing created in the image of God and in his likeness. And that has strong ramifications. And so um, uh, I think it's important for a person, you know, fine, you read the book, you agree that the evidence is there, the biblical argument is there, that creation is true. But if that's as far as it goes, then, then you've not nearly gone far enough because that should then cause us to realize that God has a claim upon our life. He has certain demands, expectations. We Appendix B in the expanse of heaven covers the latest solar eclipse of August 21st, 2017. And there's also some very beautiful photography in the back, in the, uh, back of the book that uh, is just stunning, stunning images. But I know that the solar eclipse was a very powerful experience for you. Um, you've made videos, and you uh, were starring in someone else's videos <laughs> during that time. So could you uh, just mention a little bit of, of the overall, what you felt, and what seeing a total solar eclipse is like? Yeah, this was my second one. I did one back in 1979, and um, it's a very moving experience. If you, if you see a totality, which is 
far beyond anything you can anticipate. Everyone I've talked to has been blown away. I was blown away. Um, it's the most remarkable thing in all of creation. If I make a top ten list of the wonderful things I've seen in my lifetime, these are number one and two at the very top. It's amazing. And it's hard to describe. Photographs don't do it justice. It's, a, it's tremendous. And to me, it, it talks about the, the wonder and majesty of the Lord. You, when the totality comes, everything's going on around you, effect upon people, upon animals, but then the corona comes out, the outer atmosphere of the sun, and that's just stunning, and no photograph can capture it. And um, it's amazing. I've been to two, and both of them were very, very different from one another, wonderfully different. And so uh, these things are habit-forming. I'm... Uh, I'm impatient for uh, 2024, <laughs> so I'm going to try to sneak a few more in uh, between and after. I'm kicking myself all those years I didn't travel to remote places to see these because they are uh, remarkable things. And uh, again, the pictures we have are great, but that's just a pale imitation of the real thing. Right. Okay. Um, to kind of summarize the book, I'll, I'll start off and maybe Danny will, will finish here, but I learned a lot about just creation cosmology. I learned a lot about our solar system. Uh, just the, the things that are brought out in the book from a creation viewpoint really are eye-opening. And uh, it's, you know, we highlighted a few of those in the earlier video and it's just, uh, it's a phenomenal book and it has a very powerful message. It also gets into some issues regarding uh, topics that pop up frequently on Facebook or on social media like Flat Earth, uh, Doomsday Prophecies, things like that. And uh, you just see a good biblical treatment of these things, which is very hard to find uh, in social media. So it's, it's great that these things are covered in the book. So, Danny, anything further? I just mean these two to, be a, to go together. I call it a companion book to this first one, not a sequel, but a companion book. And it, um, together they, they really do the whole scope of what I think is, is creation astronomy. So... Uh, they're a package deal. I suspect in the future they'll probably put the two together in cellophane and uh, sell them together at a discount price. Right. Again, it would make a great textbook uh, for people to use at university or any other places uh, on, on biblical astronomy. All right. Well, we have one more thing to cover, ah. <laughs> and that is cheer wine. Danny and I are both fans of cheer wine. It's a drink made in South Carolina. North Carolina, actually. Oh, actually, I'm sorry. I made it don't tell too many people. He's got the regular version. I, unfortunately, have to have the diet version. But uh, It's a cherry you, soda. Oh, yeah, and it's a nectar. If you like cherry, I mean, some people said, well, they had to, you know, cherry, cherry um, like soft, uh, like uh, um, uh, cough syrup growing up. But I thought when I was growing up getting cough syrup, the, the cherry part was made it kind of worthwhile being sick. But anyway, it's, it's wonderful stuff. And notice I'm having it in my Clemson mug. That's something else that uh, Clemson is something that Troy yeah. and I also share an interest in. Yeah, we're both Clemson fans. We took one on the chin last week. Don't have to mention that. <laughs> Edit that part out. <laughs> By the way, I, I, uh, I was able to find, you know, it, it's big in the southeast, but it's, you can find it in specialty stores across the country. So when I was in Oregon for the uh, Eclipse, I looked, got online, and I found a store that had bottles of the stuff, which is really cel celebratory. So I went out and I bought 20 bottles and took them with me on our, our group. And about five minutes before totality, we were opening them up and toasting for the whole thing. So a uh, great, great way to celebrate an eclipse and Clemson victories when, when we get them. I break them out and drink them. So if you love cherry sodas, pick up a cheer wine or a diet cheer wine. And uh, again, we recommend the books, Create a Cosmos <laughs> and the Danny's newest book, The Expanse of Heaven. Thank you.